Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be reading 7 through 16. I'm going to read it first and then we'll have scripture on the screen to break it down. Ephesians 4. 7 through 16. This, this scripture today is, is deep and it's going to require another series on the gifts of the Spirit. So that would be down the road. Just so you know, I couldn't spend a ton of time breaking down the gifts of the church. But uh, my heart and desire for a while now has been to teach the church on the spiritual gifts that God has given us. So we will get to that. Uh, we learned last week, uh, and I plan on doing that before the end of this year, uh, talking about the gifts of the Spirit. I look forward to that. I want to I teach the church who the Holy Spirit is and how he, how he operates in your life. And so I'm looking forward to that time. Uh, we're, we learned last week that, that Jesus has united us as one body and he gives us the responsibility to keep that unity, to preserve it by treating each other with grace, love, patience, all the amazing uh, humility, all the amazing traits of the Holy Spirit, the traits of Christ. And he goes in to say that we're one family. Uh, we're one, uh, we, we follow one Lord. We have one baptism, one faith. And then we're in verse seven, and this is what it says. So he focuses on this unity of the body. And then all of a sudden he turns the tide a little bit here. And he says in verse seven, however, he has given each of us a special gift, or in your version, it may say grace through the generosity of Christ. And it's not the grace of salvation here. It's the, it's the grace of a gift from God. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part, so that's us, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. You may imagine that my study time this week was a little difficult because that scripture is rich. And there is so much to unpack. There might be a a chance that we don't get to finish what I have on my notes today. And that's quite all right. Um, I'm going to attempt that. And uh, so first of all, we need to understand that this is in the context of the theme of unity in the body of Christ. Verses 1 through 16, Paul is talking about what unity looks like, how you preserve it. And when I read this and I studied it, what I see in this scripture is how you strengthen or build up the unity in the body of Christ. And so I want to break down, I'm going to end with really just mainly two takeaways of how we build up, how we strengthen the church, how we strengthen our unity. We learned last week that Paul is challenging the church to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord's call in your life, worthy of of being his child. And so he's, he saved you, and now he wants you to live like his child, a holy child. And the word worthy is axios. And I, told, I, I taught us that last week. It has to do with this picture of scales and balancing the scale. And basically, basically what Paul is saying is that I want you 
church to balance your life, to be consistent with the call God has called you, to let it be equal. If God has called you to love one another, love. If God, if God is love, love. If God is patient, patient, and he is. If God is truthful, then be truthful. So it's, he's, he's saying, live this life worthy. Balance it with the word of God. Balance it with God himself. Make sure we're consistent. In other words, he doesn't want the church to be hypocritical and say they are believers and yet live another life. Paul urges the community to show grace to one another, to preserve unity because we're in one body, one spirit, one future hope, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, and one God. If you need to catch up, our sermon from last week is on YouTube, and you can watch it there. So today, we're learning how to strengthen the church, and we see in this scripture that the gifts of God, the gifts of Christ, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to each of us to help one another grow. And that's where he goes first. And let's look at this. Verse 7, and we're going to look at it one more time. We're going to read it, and then we're going to break it down. However, he has given each of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Some of you, again, may have grace here. He has given each of us. So he focused on unity, all of us together, one spirit, one body, one baptism. Now he's saying, however, there's unity in your diversity as well. And that he's given each one of you a special gift to help each other. Through the generosity of Christ, these gifts don't come from something that I can muster up or you can muster up. It's only from Jesus Christ and only his people, his children receive a gift. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. This is a quote from Psalm 68, and it's a very interesting uh, picture here. When a king or a general or a conquering king would go into battle, he would save the prisoners of war, and he would take the plunder from that war, and they would do a parade through the city for days. And it would take days to do. And it was a way to celebrate what was accomplished in battle. And what we see here is that Jesus did that for us. Now, I want to go further into the scripture and read it more before I break that down. Notice that it says, this is what he says. Paul takes this like little break and says, notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. What is Paul talking about here? He's talking about how Jesus came down to earth and lived among us. Paul came down and he humbled himself. Philippians 2 is a great cross reference here. He lowered himself. He's the king of the universe. He lowered and humbled himself to be with us. But why? Because eventually, while he was here on earth, he would fight for us like that conquering king. And then when he ascended, then the gifts would follow for all of us he saved. And so he had to ascend. He had to go to his father. And when he did, that's where the blessings once again poured out. It's a beautiful picture that Jesus, we just sang it today, the battle belongs to the Lord. I didn't tell her to do that song. The battle belongs to the Lord. He's fighting for us. He fought for us. And this is, I, mean, I want to just go ahead and get to it. <laughs> I just want to get to it. Jesus Christ, our conquering king, defeated sin, death, and Satan for us. Yes. He came down. We couldn't do it. We were doomed. And he, came, he lowered himself. 
He served. He washed, as I said last week, he washed his enemy's feet, Judas. <sighs> he died for Judas too. How much do you think he loves his own children? I mean, <laughs> come on, it's amazing. As if that wasn't enough. Like that's enough. But Jesus blesses us with spiritual gifts we are to use to strengthen one another and thrive. It's one of the reasons why we titled this series Stronger, because we're to come out of this world stronger. We're supposed to grow stronger together. And, and in one of the hardest times in our world, we need to grow stronger as the church. Jesus did that for us. He fought sin and death and Satan on our behalf. And when he won, not only did he set you free as a prisoner of war, set you free from those chains of sin and bondage, he said, let me give you some gifts as well to bless other people. Oh, that's important that we understand. You have been blessed with a gift from Christ to bless others, not to bless yourself. But in the process, you will be blessed. Because when God uses your gifting and you see it help another believer in Christ, oh man, you get excited. You're just like, thank God that worked out. Thank God that, you know, I, I've had words for people. The, the scripture, we'll get into it, the, a word of knowledge for someone. I've had it. I'm like, Lord, I'm not going to say that. And then I say it and it's like, that's exactly what I need to hear. That's what I've been praying about. Uh, let me not get ahead of myself. So he goes on to talk about these gifts. What's really weird though is he only focuses on leadership gifts here for a moment. He doesn't leave the whole church out in other books. But for this moment, because of the focus of maturing the saints, he focuses more on leadership gifts here more than he focuses on the entire body's gifts. But we're going to read some of those. He says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Who do we match our lives to? Jesus Christ. So what are apostles? Apostles are messengers of the Lord. It means to, to be sent. They were the sent ones in the Greek. Sent ones by Jesus Christ. The greatest example of apostles are our 12 apostles, the 12 disciples. Jesus sent them as ambassadors, as messengers out into the mission field to say the kingdom is at hand. Repent, turn back to God, come to him. Believe in Jesus Christ, especially when Christ rose again and ascended. They began to preach uh, under the power of the Holy Spirit. And they said, believe in Jesus Christ. Okay. The prophets, they would speak on behalf of God. They would have a word for the Lord and they would speak to the people to edify them, to build them up. Sometimes warnings, encouragement, sometimes rebukes. Then you have evangelists. Evangelists are gifted at proclaiming the gospel to people. And it's not that you can't do this yourself, okay, as in it, you, we all should share the faith and share Jesus Christ. But evangelists will have this gifting where, man, it just, you just, it just, it's different. It hits different. And I love that. I love to see evangelists operate in their gifting. I love that. And the pastors and teachers, the pastors are those caretakers, those shepherds. I'm, I'm a pastor and, and I'm a teacher. And so we have this uh, responsibility to care for the flock, to build them up to teach them. Sometimes there's correction and then there's the encouragement and to teach the word of God. So you have teachers. Some people are so gifted at teaching. Pastor Kuhn's a gifted teacher. Uh, Sten Daniels, others in this church, gifted teachers. I mean, they just light up when they teach. They can teach for four hours straight and they're, just, and they're still happy. I don't know how they do that. It's amazing. Uh, Jody, Jody is a great example of a teacher. So their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Now, I want to say something that 
really does take more unpacking to do. And so I'm careful to bring up something without explanation and taking an adequate time to do it. But some people believe that these giftings and the other gifts that I'm going to bring up later are gone. They're not to be used anymore. And it's weird because we're all good with pastors and teachers, but we're not, we're not good with people operating in these other gifts. And it just doesn't make sense to me because I've watched people in my own family be apostles. My mom and dad are apostles. Like they know how to go in dark places and start churches. They know how to do that. And God can use them in that way. Uh, apostles in modern day times are missionaries. They go where no one else will go to be messengers. And church planners, church planners, they have to start from scratch and they're, they have this gifting of apostleship in their life. Now, the reason why I would disagree with a, a, a pastor or a theologian or teacher uh, who would say that they have ceased is because of this verse right here. Because it says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son. The last time I checked, the church is not living in unity and has not matured into the full standard of Jesus Christ. And if you're going to throw out the apostles and the prophets and evangelists, then you need to throw out the other two gifts too, which is me. Because we need to be consistent with scripture. So be careful when people tell you that it's done. Now, do I think we need to walk around and go, well, I'm apostle this, I'm apostle. No, I think there's, you gotta be careful about the pride that you come with. I think you need to be ordained by a church or by a fellowship. I think you need to have authority over your apostles. The authority over Paul and them was the council in Acts chapter 15. They had authority over them. And James led as an authoritative figure as well, and John did. And they, they actually sent Barnabas and Paul out. So Paul still had authority over him. And so the reason why I love being a part of the Assemblies of God Fellowship and our church is part of the Assemblies of God is because someone's there to check me and make sure I'm staying accountable to the Word of God. All right, we need that in our, in our, in our pastors. Pastors need accountability. Teachers, apostles, event, we need accountability because there's a lot of false teaching going on too. There's a lot of abuses of power. There's a lot of abuses of leadership and it's wrong in God's eyes. It's wrong. And so I thank God for our board of our, of our deacons here. I thank God for them as uh, holding me accountable. And I thank God for our network and Dr. Emil, who uh, is my overseer as well, a presbyter. So that's how that works. Well, here's the thing. It says their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work. The word equip or perfecting is this picture of broken bones being fixed up and then being whole again like putting on cast to bad teaching, fixing the bad teaching, fixing the bad, the lifestyles that weren't right. And what is he talking about here? Well, when people get saved, they have some, some growing to do. When, when people believe in Jesus Christ, they've followed the ways of this world, now they're following the ways of Christ. And so the word equip here or perfecting in other translations or to grow uh, is to mend or repair the brokenness of sin in someone's life. Now, Jesus already conquered sin. So that's, that's been done. But there's still some residual effects of behaviors and patterns in our lives. And so God has called leadership gifts to the church to help those people overcome their past and continue to grow and strengthen forward. Why? Because if we go back to the first verse, it says, each of us has received a gift. Not just me, you too. In the family of God, he has gifted you with a gift to use. And so the goal of leadership gifts is to get you to a place where you grow in Christ and now you operate in your gifts. And so some of you might one day may be called to go plant a church or to go reach a neighborhood in your home through a Bible study and that would be apostleship. That would be that gifting, that flow of apostleship where no other Bible studies have been, you start one. This church started by an amazing, beautiful, God-fearing woman who said, Dover, Delaware needs a spirit-filled church. So she opened up her kitchen for a Bible study and they prayed for a revival. And when that revival took place at a tent, in downtown Dover, near Fridays. Anyone know where TGI Fridays is? And a storm came through and blew through. That was the start of this church right here. 
And then God began to appoint pastors and teachers to help build up the church to where it is today. And we were blessed to have Pastor Kuhn and my mom and my dad be here for 40 years to help us grow. And all those who were not on full-time staff that God used to get us to where we are today. Thank God for that. Let me make sure I'm not losing anything here. Okay. Now here's the other gifts. We're going to go to, uh, to Romans 12. I just want you to be aware of these before we keep moving into the series because you can start to do some studying on them as well. Romans 12, starting verse 4. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In the family of God, we belong to each other. We're responsible for one another. We're, we're there to love one another, to care. In his grace, God has given us, and by the way, when I say responsible, um, we're responsible to help each other grow and mature in Christ. In Hebrews 10, it, it says, do not forsake the assembly, right? But the reason he says that is because before that, it says spur one another on towards love and good deeds. You can't spur one another on towards love and good deeds, encouraging those things if we don't get together. Now, here's the thing. Uh, you could easily come in on Sunday morning and hear me and encourage, I'm encouraging you today to, to grow and to learn your spiritual gifts and to operate in them. But the thing is, is God wants you to do that for someone around you. And we don't have that kind of time. And so the church wasn't supposed to just attend Sunday mornings. They were supposed to get together uh, for food. How many like to eat? A lot of people, they count out eating for some reason. Like they, they, you know, like they don't realize the power of food, but it breaks down walls. I'm serious. I, it, breaks, it, it, it breaks down immune systems too, but it, it hurts things. And confidence, it breaks down confidence depending on what you eat, but it can do some damage. But the thing is, is it breaks down walls between two different people too. That time to share a meal together where you get to learn and understand one another it is beautiful. And so if you have an enemy, have a meal. And you know what? Buy it. Buy it for your enemy. See what God does. But, but food brings people together. And so they would eat together. Now today we can just have a cup of coffee. That's great. You know, go for a walk, hang out on our front porch or our back porch, whatever it is with, with a neighbor. And, and there you can actually, or to be honest with you, with the body of Christ, because this is in the context of building up the church, we can be there for one another. You know what's amazing is we have phones. You can call someone today and encourage them with scripture and prayer. Amen. So let me go on into the gifts. <laughs> that was a commercial break. But it, it makes sense because we can't possibly... I'm going to say, all right, you know what? I'm going to keep going. How do you know? This is really simple. How would you know if Joe Schmo, that's what we say, all right, John Smith, John Doe, how would you know if they needed encouragement if we didn't take 10 minutes to say hi to him or her before we leave, all right? So you got Jane Doe, you got John Doe in this here. I'm just using no names, right? Unless your name is John Doe. You, when we take time to talk, we can find out there's something to pray about. And there's also something to encourage. And it may be that this past week, when you were hanging out with God, he gave you a word, a scripture, and you're like, why is that still on my heart and mind? And the next thing you know it, you're saying hi to another believer in Christ. And God's like, you need to share what I told you to share on Wednesday. This is how it works. It's just that we're so quick to dart out of here or we haven't created a space in our calendar, our weekly schedule, to be with the body of Christ. Paul is talking about in the context where the church was going to be around each other more than on Sunday and hour. We have to understand that. We're in the Western American 21st century culture. This was the first church, the 100th century. 
okay? The first century here, the first hundred years, sorry. The first century church. And so it's so important we understand the context here. Okay, like I said, let's get into the gifts. In his grace, that's why the word grace, it may be in your translation for Philippians, or I'm sorry, Ephesians 4, 7. God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. That's cool. Now, Paul, Paul gives a variety of gifts and leaves some out and every time he brings it up. And he doesn't, it's not like he's purposely trying to do that. He just, it's almost like when he's writing, he's like, okay, that's enough. Let me, let me get to the point. But in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11, he adds some more gifts. It says in verse 4, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. Let me me stop real quick. Verse 7, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other feel really good, and I can feel good about myself. No. It's to serve each other, to help each other. He gives us a gift to make us feel really important and get a high position in the church. No. No, in fact, when you begin to operate in your gifts, it's a very humble and humbling journey. We must be very careful what we say the Lord is saying. We want to represent God well. Look at me, I'm getting into my Gifts of the Spirit series right now. All right, let's keep going. He says here, to one person, the spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. So wisdom, the gift of wisdom. To another, the same spirit gives a a message of special knowledge, a word of knowledge. Something that only God would know and that person would know. And all of a sudden, you know. And so you share it. The same spirit gives great faith to another and to someone else. The one spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy, to speak for God. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the spirit of God, so the gift of discernment, or from another spirit. So whether it's from God or if it's from another spirit, still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages. So tongues, when you hear someone speak in tongues or an unknown language, that is a gift, while another or that same person can also interpret their gift, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. You're given these gifts. You can't buy them. They're grace gifts. You can't earn them. You can't negotiate with God and go, God, I want to be a healer. You know why, right? He's going to check your heart on why you want to be a healer. He gives what you're supposed to have. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So you see that list there, and I'll take a break from there. Paul gives us lists of gifts to help us understand what those gifts are. But how do we discover our gifts? This brings up some important questions. How do we discover our gifts? Well, the best way is in fellowship with other believers. The best way is to be serving one another to help one another, to be around the body of Christ and serve. And then as you do that, you know what you experience? Passion, energy, joy. You see that gift work and you're like, oh. And, and, and you're, you're back at home that day and you're laying your head on the pillow and you go, what just happened today? God just used me to share this or to encourage or to have great faith in a situation that seemed doomed, doom and gloom, and you showed up with faith. Or, or you ready for this? Leadership ability. The church needed someone to lead a ministry and you stepped up this past week and you're crushing it. See what I'm saying? That's what happens. As you do, you discover. 
Now, can you read these gifts and do like a gift assessment? Yes. But at the same time, like there's like surveys of gift assessments online. But at the same time, God could be like giving you a different gift for a new season in your life. I've no, my gifts, when I did an assessment, my gifts when I first came in changed from where they are now today. Now, as a pastor, I still have that authority and that teaching gifting, the leadership gifting, but I've noticed that God has increased. One of the gifts that I did not expect to get from God is hospitality. I love hosting people now and, and, and being there for them, especially my neighbors, those who are lost, those who I'm pouring into. I love hosting Bible studies and prayer times and things like that. I did not expect that to occur. So how do we discover these things is by actually doing them and using them. Um, How do we grow in our gifts? Use and practice them on a regular basis, which means we must serve one another on a regular basis. And where do we use them? Well, we've kind of already said that. You can use them here and we can use them throughout the week whenever we're around other followers of Jesus Christ. Can I give some, I love, I love, um, a loving correction. Can I do that? My dad would say this too over the years, and I agree 100%. If we're expecting for the gifts to only operate today on Sunday morning in the hour and 15 minutes, that is not good. God is not put in a box. You have the spirit of God in you wherever you go. And he will use the gifts, not just for believers, but unbelievers too. I'm telling you, God is giving me words for people out in the public. And I went to them fearfully, humbly, almost going, I don't even know this is going to make sense to you. But I, God is, I mean, my chest is crushed until I say this to you. And I'll say it. And, and, and I, it was, I've had one where someone's, someone's child was sick and God was going to heal them. I never saw that person again. And I kind of am afraid of what happened, but I, I, I just felt this great faith rise up in me. And I saw her outside of AI DuPont hospital. She had a child there and I, I couldn't walk in. I couldn't walk in the hospital. I was walking by them and they're grieving to my left. And I had to turn around. And it was like, I mean, I, had, I have chills go down my spine right now talking about it. The, the presence of God was so heavy on me to put faith into their hearts and to say, God is going to touch your child today. And I just got to trust God with the results. Now, I wouldn't do that if I had a stomach ache and I was like, oh, this must be the Lord. No, I could tell it was the Lord. I felt convicted if I walked away from them. I felt like I was sinning if I walked away. That's how I knew. And as you mature in your gifts, you will begin to understand how they work like that. And as you use them, you will, your faith will increase and have, oh, that's God, that's God right now. And again, it's so important that we do not abuse the gifts either and that we are responsible with them. So how do we grow? We use them. And, and I just want you to know that we don't just use them here on Sunday mornings. We use them all week. We, we can't wait for Sunday morning for us to think all of a sudden the spirit of God is going to show up. He wants to show up all week. His work is not done all week. And the more we get together as a body of Christ, you will see that. You know, it's really interesting that one of the gifts is encouragement and there's too many discouraged people in the body of Christ. That tells me the body of Christ isn't together enough. Because Pastor Ryan can only preach so many messages on a Sunday morning. I I can't give you a buffet sermon of, all right, today we're going to talk about encouragement. Today we're going to talk about trust. Today we're going to talk about faithfulness. Today we're going to talk about forgiveness. Today we're going to talk about temptation. I can't do all that because I'm not supposed to. The church of Jesus Christ is supposed to use their gifts too. And when we get together and encourage one another, there'll be less discouraged people because it's a gift of the church. There are people suffering financially, and yet God has blessed people generously to give generously. It's a gift, giving. There are kindness is a gift, love and patience. Faith is a gift. People are discouraged. When the church is discouraged, when the church doesn't have faith, 
we have to look at ourselves and go, but then that means we need to be together more and, and fill that gap and fix that. And Paul is talking about that we as leadership gifts, and you guys are, this is an amazing church because you come in here hungry for the word, hungry to grow. And so that's a beautiful sign of maturity and growing. And so my role is to help you mature and use them as well. So that's not all on the stage. And let me close with this. So I knew I wasn't, God, man, I was struggling this, this week trying to get this sermon short enough. And now I know why. God had different plans. We'll save the last paragraph, 14 through 16 through next week. You're like, man, are we ever going to get through Ephesians? Yeah, when it's, when it's God's time. You know, it's fun. This is good stuff. We need to take time to apply things. And I want, to, I want you to understand, I want you to, to know my heart as a pastor. I've been called to train, equip, teach for you as well to do the work of the ministry as the scripture says. Because what's, what the purpose of the leadership gifts was to help the church grow and mature in their giftings to work and to serve. Let's go to the scripture, okay? And the pastors and teachers, their responsibility is to equip, to mend, to fix, to grow God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Paul is saying, this is on all of us. And the reason why is because he knows you're gifted. You may not see it in you, but you are gifted. And some of us need to have the I see in you conversation. I see in you God working and encouraging and serving and your generosity, and your love, and your hospitality. Your brownies are so good. They're going to lead someone to Jesus. You know, we got to say that to people. You know that's not what it is. It's that, that person who brings the brownies, or some of these guys, man, they, they barbecue up a storm. Your ribs are delicious. But it's because you invited the lost to your home at the same time. Or it's because you invited a brother or sister in Christ at the same time. And it wasn't your brownies. It was the Holy Spirit using that hospitality to bring a, a hurting person into your home or into your lunchtime. And you were there at the perfect time. God ordained appointed time to be there for that person. And by golly, make sure you stay with that person as long as you're supposed to. Don't just do one and done. Always be there as long as you can for someone. See them through that trial. See them, see that believer through that circumstance as much as you can. So what's, I, let, me, let me share my heart. My heart is, going back to an important question, what's the purpose of being a part of the church on Sunday morning and throughout the week? I'm called to equip, to teach, to train, to care for the flock, to edify you, to build you up, to, to have I see in you conversations that you can do it, that you can serve God in this way or that way. My job is not to entertain you on Sunday morning. I have to make sure you understand that. There's way too many, there's a culture right now of five-star reviews on everything. I ignore them. Because sometimes people aren't gonna like what I have to say if it's the word of God. I'm not here to perform. This is not a performance to me, and it never will be. And I need you to know too, the band is not here to perform. We pray hard about every Sunday. They are servants of the Lord. They've been called to help us worship, to lead, God, to lead us to God, to get our hearts on God, to praise him as the word says to do. But this band, I don't care how good they are compared to every, I, do not compare our band with another band in this community. That's not what it's about. Do not compare me with other pastors. It's not, that's not what it's about. This is not a performance. God has called us to equip, not to perform. That's not what the scripture says. Amen. So if I'm boring to you, that's okay. Because I've read some scripture that's sort of boring at times, okay? And sometimes some messages and some things could be a little bit slower. And that's okay. We need to grow up. And that's the whole point of the scripture is you grow up. And you know that sometimes when you open your Bible and read it, you're like, that didn't even hit me at all. 
Okay. But guess what you did? God was important in your day. God sees your heart and knows you're trying. And you're honoring God by taking time to be with him. But not, I mean, there's other conversations you can have on that too. Because there, if we slow down enough, turn off our phones, turn off our minds, we'll also pick something up from the word too that we weren't seeing. And that's, that comes from experience. But what does this mean? If I'm not here to entertain, you're not here to be entertained either. You're here to be equipped. Now, why would you need to be equipped? What do you, why, would you, why would we need to be equipped? Because the work of God is not done. Because we have other believers in this church and around the world that need our help to grow. Because we're still immature. And that's what Paul gets to next in our next portion of scripture. Amen? I'm so glad I went with the flow of the Holy Spirit today. We need to go deeper in this topic. Let's pray. Amen. God, we thank you so much for your word. And Lord, thank you for this church. God, we want this to be true in our lives, this scripture. We see what you did for us on the cross, the resurrection, (laughs) how you rose again. And then when you ascended, you even blessed us with gifts to help each other. Wow, so grateful for that. Lord, I, I thank you for my calling. I thank you for the calling you have on this church, every individual in this room and online. I thank you, God, for that. Lord, I pray that you would minister to them, grow them, use them. Lord, show us our giftings as we serve one another, as we fellowship with the body of Christ, even in our own homes, as we love on our kids and our spouses. Lord, or, or our friends who are living with us, whatever it may be. God, I pray that you would show us our gifts. May we mature in them. God, we're not here to entertain. We're not here to be entertained. And I thank you for a church that thinks that way. We're here to be equipped because your work is not done. People need to grow spiritually in the body of Christ. And many people don't even know what Jesus has done for them in our community. So grow us as a church to be ready and also to just go do and mature while we are doing. We thank you, Lord, for your word today. Strengthen us by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church.